Why we can Okay, so that's <laughs> okay. So, so this is happening across the county, maybe even across the city. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, that was just he looked around and he was all excited for a second. It's, it's, it's different, longer, but yeah, that's what I'm bringing up. We know why that would be great, but it's definitely more than two or three years. This has been going on for quite a while. So they used to have, you know, this thing that comes up and says, do this to stay. And keep having shifted, and it's been going on for 20 years. Okay. Anybody else have some? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So uh, this is a little discussion about Whiting Ranch that a lot of us have been to. Who has been there? Who has never been there? Who's going to go this weekend? <laughs> okay. Really nice. I was even there today. It's very easy to get to. Very fun. Okay, so let's move on here. Here's our project. Yeah, here's our project. Sit down. There we go. There we go. The controls forward and back are opposite on this remote. That's the weirdest thing. All right, so uh, here are the players today. I'm going to talk a little bit about local history and geology. Ron about botany blitz, etc. Mike about the uh, checklist. Fred about rare plants. And Rebecca is going to talk about everything else. <laughs> so the rest of us are going to get lots of rest. And Rebecca's going to take over most of the evening, which is good. Because look at us grungy guys here. <laughs> and, and Rebecca's going to step in. OK. So here is my part of history and geology of. Is that uh, a plug? Wait, wait a minute. How'd that book get there? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Do you expect me not to do that? I'll do it on everything. You guys do that. All right, here's a, from the book. Here's the map of the county, and then Winding Ranch is right in there. It's number 16, and it's right next door to Limestone Canyon. So here's Whiting. It's not a giant park. And then here's Limestone Canyon next to it that's a, a preserve. Uh, who's been on uh, Limestone Canyon? Who's been there? Who's never been to Limestone Canyon? Well, there's this really great mountain bike guy that shows you where all the fences have been cut and you can sneak in. So check, no, don't check that out. <laughs> what that, I talked about. that really does exist. Don't do it. They've been trying to catch that guy for years. Okay, and then here is the park map showing lighting. So here's the uh, toll road, I think. And then over here we have not wearing my glasses, so good luck. Here is one entrance. This is Borrego Canyon. These are all houses next to it. Above it, this is a canyon. So it's a really narrow spot, but it's very shady and easy, easy hiking. So you go through here, and then you can go up these other trails to different parts of it. Here's the outline of Whiting right here. And then there's another piece over here, the McFadden House, where historically the foreman of the ranch uh, used to live in this family, and now it's the headquarters for the park. Uh, you might notice that it's not connected to the park. Kind of unusual, but that's the way it is. The house is here, and this little sliver right here they own as well, but there's a wonderful bike trail that goes right next to it. It's a great house to visit. It's really pretty. All right, so anyway, here are their properties, and here is an aerial view with the park laid in and so the park is kind of broken into little pieces here and there. And there's most of it. And then the thin strip here, little thin strip here. And then way down here uh, used to be part of the property, but it was sold. And this is now the Lake Forest Sports Center. It used to be where Dwight Whiting, the original landowner, grew walnuts. So when the county acquired it, I was asked to come in and identify the plants on that plot, and there were walnuts, walnut trees right there. It's used to grow lots of stuff. And uh, then they gave the land to Lake Forest and they uh, closed them all down and quit any sports center. Okay, so that red kind of outlines where it's at. And then here we go, early days. I really like a lot too. 
So this guy here, this is Don Jose Antonio Fernando Serrano. And he was given this by the governor of Alta California uh, in 1842. What was it like back then, Mike? Okay, and then uh, the ranch, the ranch was expanded and eventually became 10,688 acres. Could you imagine having that much land? It's crazy. It's crazy. But in 1864, a horrendous drought hit, and all of his cattle died, and he lost. The place. It's really not very sad. Here is uh, it's a little map of this designed at the Rancho de los Alisos. That's where that's what the ranch is called, right? There's in Spanish. And then I know mean, you can't find the darn thing on this. You really have to pour over it very detailed. Here are the Santa Ana Mountains up here, the La Masa Santiago are right in through here, the foothills, and then various hills that are not to scale, right? <laughs> so you kind of figured that out, didn't you? All right. So, but it is a real map from way back then in, in 1846. It's a pretty fun thing to find. And then we have these guys here in 1846, Don Pio, no, Don Pio de Jesus Pico, uh, governor of Alta California, the old name of this place right here, grants that ranch, a different ranch, sorry, a different ranch. The uh, Rancho Lomas de Santiago to Teodosio Juan Yorba. And according to historians, and I've checked with historians, there are no pictures, paintings, or drawings of this guy existing. So I put in pictures of his two sons. That's as close as we can get. And that's uh, Sebastiano and uh, Ramon Yorba. All right. And their house was at, well, where Irvine Lake is right now. Oh, we sadly don't keep a lot of our historical places. It's really sad. It's um, underwater. It's gone. All right. And that ranch was 47,226 uh, acres. I mean, only these huge ranchos. Just enormous. But in 1864, the drought hit, of course, and their cattle died too. Uh -oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh -oh. And then this guy, William Wolfskill. What a great name. Right? Wolfskill. He purchases uh, Rancho La Mas de Santiago from Teodosio Juan Yorba, and that was 47,226 acres, the whole ranch he purchased from them. Uh, by the way, this guy is the first person to grow oranges in Orange County. Did you know Orange County is not named for the fruit? Nope. True story. You know. What's it named for? Well, they decided to name it Orange County after they seceded from the rest of the L.A. County. Right? Yes, how they come up with the name? We have to get all the cities to agree. How they do it? it didn't it like sound nice on a map or something? No, nope, it's dumb. Okay, it's, <laughs> really dumb. it's so dumb. So the, the committee that wanted to pull this county off of L.A. County, Jonathan, you must know. Yep, what is it? I can't hear you. Sunset. 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 No. So there was a committee to to figure out how to branch off of LA County. So she used to be LA County. And the only city that would not agree was the city of Orange. <laughs> and the only way they could they could break off and form a new county, the city of Orange said, We'll do it if you name the county after our city. <laughs> So the name said fine. So the county is named after the city. The city is named after the fruit. There's your tip in of the day. <laughs> so during that drought, which is actually a two-year drought, the cattle, his cattle, this guy was super sharp. He moved his cattle to meadows near San Bernardino. Can you imagine taking a big herd of cattle all the way to San Bernardino? That's I can't even believe that. And then moved them back in 1865 when they finally got some rain. So that's just unreal. And then in 1866, he sold the whole ranch to Llewellyn Bixby. You might know that name, Bixby, if you live in Long Beach, especially. Uh, and then Dr. Thomas Flynn and Benjamin Flynn, and this guy I've never heard of, James Irvine. Yeah. Okay. And so here is. Um, this evil looking guy foreclosed on the ranch. 
right, foreclosed on it, and he divided it into 10 unequal sized parcels, and this guy bought it. Look at that photo. Wow, it's such a good photo. This is a professional really knew what they're doing. It's way back when. It's like kind of like one of your relatives, though. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> All right. So I remember I, I know you're there. I have a chance on that. So in 1887, Dwight Whiting, who is from Boston, many historical accounts say he's from England. Nope. Nope. And so he moved from Boston, you know, that accent kind of sounds English if you're kind of crazy. So he moved from Boston to California for his health, and he really liked it here. In 1884, he purchased 8,500 acres of Rancho Cañada de los Alisos. You know it is Lake Forest. No name is El Toro. That's another story. Uh, and so he named it El Toro, which is actually the classic name from the Portola expedition of what, 1769. That's what they called it. And he lived there and he grew lots of fruit. And he wrote a book in 1893. And I have a copy. Here's the cover. <laughs> Sorry, the title page. Fruit Farming for Profit in California. Mm. What's really funny about that is. He couldn't. <laughs> uh, he did grow stuff, but it was really hard to get water. Imagine that, hard to get water here. All right. This is a picture of him. See the big guy with the stogie in the back seat? This is Dwight Whiting in 1907, and probably the last photo of him before he died. It's thought to be by historians. This is the family tree. Yeah, I love genealogy too. Okay, so here he is. Here's the confusion. A lot of people go, oh, Whiting Ranch, named for Dwight Whiting. Which one? So here's him, there's his picture. And then he had a girl, died at age 10 or 11. I can't find out why. And then Dwight Anson Whiting, and then George Nathaniel Whiting. I put gold blue because they were involved with the ranch. The two kids grew up in what we call El Toro or Lake Forest. He built a beautiful home there that we didn't keep. We just went and bulldozed it down too. Okay. Anybody remember the, the uh, recalendars in downtown El Toro or Lake Forest, whatever you want to call it? Okay. His in laws used to live in a two story, beautiful Victorian right there where Marie Callender's was. Oh, we pulled those three calendars too. I forgot. Okay, so you you youngsters aren't gonna know where that is. Really close to Dan's house. So make an appointment. He'll take you. All right. So here are these guys, and what's interesting is that five of these people are buried in El Toro Cemetery. That's kind of fun. All right. So he had three different wives. Kids. He didn't have a ton of kids. But there it is. So you got to be careful if you see the name Dwight Whiting, how do you know which one's which? You know what? You go to Ike's Sandwiches in Lake Forest, on, uh, right by, what is that, Rockfield? In Lake Forest? Ike's Sandwiches, been doing Ike's. Huh? Huh? More people need to go. One of their sandwiches is named in his honor. You can go have a Dwight Whiting sandwich at Ike's. <laughs> and I asked the the woman behind the counter, do you know who that is? She said, I have no idea. <laughs> so I told her. <laughs> okay, so the this is 1959, the year that we're living in for me, because that's when I was born. Thank you, youngsters. I can just see, oh, there goes Mel. You're going to meet grief again. Okay, so uh, is this front row right here, Mel? <laughs> Three of them are <laughs> one of them is lots younger than okay. Guess which ones? Okay, so, figure it out. okay, so 1959, the Whiting family divided and sold the ranch to a developer, Baker, Baker Canyon, Baker, and then many parcels developed. Some people live on them, <laughs> okay. Dan, Trudy, Ron all live on the original El Toro. Owned by Dwight Whiting. Cool, huh? A little bit of history. 
oh, you know, you got bulldozed and they built those houses. But did you know that already, Dan? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Okay. And then uh, in 1989, OC acquired about a thousand acres of, of whiting and plus parts of Rancho Lomas de Santiago. And they opened it as whiting when they built this park. They acquired more acres. Now it's about 2,500 acres. And there's about 23 trails covering about 17 miles. I've been there since a long time and I've never been all the trails. It's just, there's a lot of trails there. Okay. And then in modern days, in about 1991 to 2013, I did lots of botanizing there, but the park didn't allow me to take specimens and I didn't break the law. So I did not take specimens. All right. So vouchers, the specimens called the voucher. So I made a list of the plants that are there, but I wasn't able to back them up with real specimens, which is really important. Okay, and then about 2022, <laughs> but I'm not sure exactly when, uh, it was botanized by a famous Dutch explorer. <laughs> and then who started the checklist project, who, start, who ran the botany blitz, many of you were there, and the checklist project still continues today. Now, a little bit of basic ecology, because we're going to talk a little, uh, just a tiny bit about uh, geology, and uh, Mel's going to know this really well. She's heard this part so many times. So here, this is my 50% of ecology in one slide. All the rest is detail. Geology. <laughs> <laughs> Use your phones, everybody. <laughs> so here's a geology. So here's a couple of hills. Kind of looks like Santiago Peak. <laughs> and uh, geology influences the geography, the landforms like this. And the geography makes it so plants can live there. Plants are often very specific to their geography and their geology. So here's our plants. And then more plants live there, and that forms habitats. Look at that. You want to live there? Nice. And then that provides places for all other life forms to live. So if you study any aspect of outdoor biology, you need to start with all of these things. And that's why biologists take all of these classes. So we have some great background. And so you get all this wonderful stuff, like red fox, who knows who that is? <laughs> Only a couple of you. All the youngsters are going, I don't know who that is. Okay. And so here's a little bit of geology. This is a shot, an aerial shot that Fred Roberts took way back. You know, the before time for you, the youngsters in the crowd in the 1970s and 80s. 1980, was it 80s? Yeah, oh, good. Good for you, Fred. He was only five years old. Yeah, I know, really. <laughs> this is Santiago Canyon Road. All right. This is right down here. Help me, Fred. This is going to be White and Ranch. All right. This is the hill up here where they have a kiosk and a water tank now way up here. This is before it was a park. The county didn't own this yet. So a pretty neat photo. <clears throat> Come on. And then uh, oh, there's the text, right? Lomas de Santiago said so sandstone foothills. The whole hill range are sandstone that's been uplifted. In some areas, that's, that sand was the beach. We're going to see that in the next slide. So uh, there are two ephemeral water courses, which means the water dries up, which is pretty typical here in Southern California. Most of our creeks dry up. At different times of year. It's really rare to see one that, that hangs on. All right, so here is Red Rock Canyon. This is in Upper uh, Whiting Ranch. Beautiful place to, to be. This isn't my photo. I think, Ron, is this yours? Okay, thank you. Isn't that a great shot? Yeah, it's a beautiful canyon. Who's been all the way up to Red Rock? Good. Oh, very good. I was looking online before I realized Ron had this going, I need a shot of Red Rock Canyon. I'm looking at my time, super busy today. All right, I'm gonna to try to get up there and take a shot. And so I, I look it online for a photo that I could use and I don't just steal anyone's photo. I steal photos like Ron's. <laughs> and all these people had climbed up on the rocks. There are signs everywhere saying, don't climb on these. And so they got up there. So the park 
system, who might be on Zoom right now, uh, would like to go after some people. Their photos are on their websites. <laughs> you can find them real easily. All right. Okay, so left turn from Borrego Canyon, right? That's one of the trails. Take you up in the Red Rock Canyon that's on the beach. Famous for its pink sediments, which are really pretty, especially when the sun shines right on. It's really pretty. Okay. And that is my portion. Thank you. Let's go to Mark. <laughs> well, what did we learn from one of the greatest naturalists in Launch County? Nothing about plants yet. <laughs> we learned there's a lot of dead cows on Launch County. <laughs> uh, let's talk about what was the project. So, the project that we're a few years into is to uh, create checklists for possibly all of the county wilderness parks. We don't know how long we're going to be alive, so we'll see. Rebecca, you're going to have to carry the torch on this. Um, and we started with Casper's Park, and now we've sort of wrapped that one up. We're now uh, in White Ridge, and it's a collaborative project between this chapter and the UCI Herbarium. Oh, oh, okay, we got clickies, okay. <laughs> and the five principles, a lot of you have been involved in this, but the five principles that are leading the project are going to be talking to you tonight. So here we, there we are. We started kind of working on it as an official project about two years ago. Uh, a lot of us have been there for years and years, though, so, uh, but kind of officially started a couple of years ago, and we're probably another year or two out before we're ready to publish anything or do anything and kind of call it final. Um, we've made a lot of visits. Uh, a lot of these are full day or you know long visits. So we spent a lot of time at the park documenting the flora. And you know why are we doing this? Well, a few different reasons. We need to know what's at a location so that if environmental change happens, could be climate change, could be a fire, could be uh, a roadway, could be some kind of vegetation management, all of those things. We need to know what's there before it's too late. If a fire were to come through the park, we want to know a baseline and what's at that park so we can go back and look at recovery um, as an example. So our goal is still to document scientifically accurately every vascular plant at the park. And when we say document, we really mean with a physical specimen, a collection, uh, a small piece, or maybe the whole plant, if it's a small annual, uh, that's preserved. And, and, and I should also say, and we want to make that information available uh, easily uh, to the rest of the research community, to you, uh, and you know, to, the, to the public. Uh, we're using three different sources of data that we're collecting. Two of these you can participate in very easily and help us. Uh, so our primary source of, of documentation is uh, the first one there. And uh, Rebecca or Mike, I think Rebecca's gonna talk a little bit more about that one. Um, but we also pull in data from Calflora and iNaturalist, which I'm sure you're familiar with both of those. I hope you're using them. Um, nonetheless, our real source of documentation is physical specimens. And those are those are housed in the California Consortium of Herbarium. herbarium. Calflora and iNaturalist are observational records only. So Bob gave a little bit of the history up until nine, uh, eight years ago. Up until eight years ago, there were only, how many, 65 records in the entire Whiting Ranch, uh, 2,500 acres. Uh, it had been really poorly documented, poorly explored botanically. Currently, as of a week or two ago, when we put the slide together, 
we had almost 800 collections, vouchers, specimens, and those are across uh, several hundred different species. Oops, I was by the wrong way, I ended up doing <laughs> We also are looking at CalFORA records, as I mentioned. There's over 2,000 records in CalFORA. And we're also in looking at the iNaturalist records. And we look at, look at CalFORA and iNaturalist so that we can go back and do a collection. So if you're putting records on any of those platforms, we're looking at them, and then we're going to get out there and try to find that one if it's something new. So really important to use those platforms so that you can inform uh, the, the, the collection of the species. And by the way, we do have permits. And like Bob didn't have one years ago, we have collection permits, thank you, Lisa, and, and county parks and the county for providing those. Don't go out and pick, start pulling plants out of the ground without permission. I have to say that, is that okay? <laughs> um, if we look at now all of the records that we know about, all of these different sources put together, oh, I think I missed a slide there. Yeah, just for fun. Um, if you really want a, the frontier of uh, botany, uh, get into bryophytes. There's only 39 records of mosses and river warts in the entire 2,500 acres. We weren't, we're not looking at those, but I just put the slide in for fun. <clears throat> Um, you can make quite a contribution there, I'm sure. So if we look at all of the vascular plant records, we're up to about 70 to 600 records now. And that's, if you remember eight years ago, under 100. So our knowledge of what's going on in that land is really grown incredibly. And you can see it on that chart there. The last few years, thanks to you and, and our team, um, we're learning a whole lot about what's going on at these parks. One of the things that a lot of you participated in and that really pushed our knowledge uh, a leap forward uh, was a botany blitz. This was our second botany blitz. And how many participated in either of the botany blitzes, either Casper's or Whiting? Yeah, so almost half of the people out there. Um, so those of you who didn't, uh, do it or don't know what it is, it, we basically grabbed a whole bunch of really good botanists first and, and got them to volunteer their day. Um, and, and that's sort of the people that were our leaders. Uh, we took a picture of most of them, but that picture on the bottom was missing Bob. Oh, I thought I had it. Oh, wait, I'm not doing this right. <laughs> Did you remove my slide? I think he did. <laughs> I, had a fun no, I, I saw the figure. It's on there. Is it that? Yeah. Go back. Oh, no, go back. Oh, no, go back. <laughs> I don't know how to use this thing. There he is. <laughs> that's not Bob. That's, that's, no, that's, Bob. that's, no, that's standing on Fred. Oh, yeah. That's, I'm going to know the Okay. Well, never mind. <laughs> okay. Never mind, all you guys. I had another one. I swear Bob removed. Um, so we took the park, we divided it into about seven areas, we put a really good botanist to lead each one of those areas, and then a whole bunch of you and about 100 people showed up to work with those botanists and to travel those areas and to record all of the species they could um, That's kind of our, our areas that we divided up into. We went out, and you know, the way a blitz works, uh, one day you cover every little area that you can possibly get to. Uh, every habitat and you record every, in our case, every plant um, that we can find, every taxon at least. And that's kind of what we did and what you did and you helped us a lot. So uh, we spent uh, a day in April doing that and the results of that one day, it was April 16th. Uh, we had about hundred participants, uh, mostly CNPS uh, members, that was great. We recorded in one day 1,700 uh, records. In 70 years, we only had under 100. In one day, we got 1,700. So Yahoo, CMPS. Um, and then there's some other cool stuff there. We recorded 299 different different taxa in that one day. 
a lot of natives, a few non-natives. Uh, we have some heroes. Laura, I just saw you. Where are you? Raise your hand. Laura Camp has become like, you're just obsessed now with my <laughs> You hardly even use it. <laughs> so you didn't even hardly use it a few years ago. And now I you're like, there you go. Yeah, yeah now you're like <laughs> documenting everything. Uh, so Laura was our, our champion with the most observations. The most species was Dan Hetzel. Laura, you make sure you'll get him. Uh, <laughs> And there's some other cool stuff. And, those, 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 <laughs> <laughs> and so those are the records that we collected in that one day, all those little dots. That's where we traveled. So that was one day. And now here's the summary of kind of where we're at right now. And we still have another year or two, we think, uh, kind of soiling in and our energy level and all of that. This is kind of where we're at. I mentioned a minute ago, almost 8,000 records, 780 collections. We've got 520 taxa, give or take one or two that we're still trying to resolve a couple of things. Uh, and about almost six, a little over 60% of those are native taxa. And as expected in an urban area, we've got almost 40% of them non-native. We've got eight sensitive, rare, or conserved species, 13 waifs. A waif is kind of a one-off, basically, something that just kind of showed up and probably isn't going to establish. Um, so we got a few of those, and a few things that were planted and just kind of left, but they've naturalized or persisted. Uh, not naturalized, but they've persisted without any intervention or water. Eucalyptus do that, some of them. Um, and then we've got five native plants that are native to California and are at the park, but aren't native to the park. So they're kind of a weird little group of plants. And so that's actually not all of the dots. My map can only display 5,000 dots at a time. So there's more dots than that map shows. That's Michael Simpson. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, thanks for coming, everybody. I'm Mike Simpson, uh, Professor Emeritus at SDSU. And I was involved in this project a little bit. I wanted to talk to you about this uh, portal that we use for tabulating all of the plant records. And how many of you in the audience have looked at the CCH2 before? Not many. Okay, well, then I'll tell you about it. You haven't seen it before. So CCH stands for the Consortium of California Herbarium. The two represents, um, the two was the result of a National Science Foundation grant that most of the herbaria in California got some money for to database, image, and otherwise curate their collections. And it also involved a new portal, a database portal, and that's called Symbiota. And it's pretty advanced, so it was a step up from the original CCH uh, database that we had. And this organizes all of the information that one collects when you vouch a plant specimen. It also has, as I'll talk about, a, a mechanism for attaching images, both in the field and the laboratory, georeferencing, mapping. And the emphasis of this project was to capture and present in an easy way phenological data that I'll mention in just a second. Okay, so well, right now, <laughs> this is phenological data. Phenology refers to the timing of reproduction. And with vascular plants, we're talking about typically when the plant flowers, when it stops flowering, when it fruits, when it stops fruiting. So with every species, when you click a species in the CCH2, and this is a cch2.org, by the way, if you'll remember that, just put that in your search engine and you'll find it right away. Click a species and you'll instantly get this graph showing the phenological data about flowering and fruiting. These, this is a comparison of two species of Pseudonephalium, Californica at the top and Rainbow System at the bottom. And at a glance, you can see they have pretty different uh, flowering times, don't they? And this could be important for a couple of reasons. You might be studying, you know, that for scientific reasons. These 
that will influence the reproductive isolation if they don't flower at the same time. Also, this is being used as a tool for uh, evaluating climate change over time. So this has actually been done in many parts of the country, in the Northeast particularly, people are doing it in California now, where we use herbarium records to evaluate timing of flowering and how that's changing now with an increase in temperature. Okay, so this is the home page of the CCH2 portal. That's what you'll see. I'm just gonna go through a few things with you. When you do searches, you the default is to search all herbaria in the CCH. Uh, I think there are close to 40 of them now. This shows the UC Irvine herbaria. IRBC is the international acronym for that, and that's where we put you know, most of our voucher specimens for these projects. You can search for uh, using a number of different criteria. You might be interested in a locality. Uh, you might be interested in a substrate type, a particular plant community. You might be interested in a time when the plant was collected and so forth. A lot of different fields you can search for. It's a very user-friendly system and very powerful. And this shows uh, the capability of attaching images. This is one of the beauties of this portal. You can attach images to it, link images, upload images to every record. And these can be put in directly. This is one of Ron Vanderhoff's collection and he takes a lot of photographs sometimes. And you can see he has them all here. This is for the Senecio and Gusta Boys that we'll talk about later. Um, in addition, we have an image of the actual herbarium specimen. So you can look at these in detail. There's the image of the herbarium specimen. You can magnify this. You can actually see little plant hairs, trichomes, if you do it you know, at a high enough magnification. So you can see quite a bit of detail. And then this is one of the photos that Ron took of a field shot. So this is really great to see what the plant looked like when it was alive, as opposed to when it's dead and pressed and glued to a sheet of paper. Very valuable tool. Uh, we also um, figured out a way to link iNaturalist records in an easy way. We have this little icon right there. This is a, a voucher record, okay, for a voucher specimen. You click that uh, icon there and you go to the INAT observation for that particular collection. So that's a unique URL and I'm iNaturalist and we link it then to the herbarium specimen. You just have to be careful that what you photograph is what you collected, all right? <laughs> you wanna be sure of that. But that's a wonderful tool, just have that, uh, that imagery that we can now connect with these specimens. Has pretty good mapping capabilities. They can map multiple taxa at one time. You just have to separate them by semicolons uh, and color codes each one. And then it gives you a map like this. And if you click one of these dots, like I do this all the time when I study, particularly I study cryptanthan relatives, and I'll often find an outlier, you know, away from the main bunch. And I'll often contact the herbarium if, I, if it doesn't have an image and ask them. Maybe it's misgeo-referenced, maybe it's misidentified. And this one right there, if you click that one right there, it's kind of an outlier. I just happened to have that here. This is actually one that I collected. <laughs> so it's gotta be right. <laughs> anyway, that's what you do. If you click a dot, you get the actual uh, CCH2 record. Okay, uh, this shows a, a, a shot of the page that lists the checklist. There are a number of checklists now that are being developed. And there's the Whiting Wrench under local boards. So we created this checklist. And I want to go over quickly how we do this. The first thing is to put bounds on the area that you're talking about. So a polygon. And I was able to do this because I was able to get KMZ or KML files from either you or from you. Okay, it stitched them together and entered them into the system. And now we have in uh, the dark shady area, uh, kind of a map of the park, pretty precise map. Then uh, the system will actually find herbarium specimens that are within that polygon automatically. So this is actually a current shot of the herbarium specimen. It's a recent one, but it does this automatically. Any herbarium specimen that is geo-referenced that has a latitude and longitude. 
Now, many of the older ones don't, right? But there is a group of people, it's called the 100 Club, that are working on this. They're looking at older specimens and attaching latitude, longitude coordinates to them. So more and more of these are being done. Okay, after that, that's easy to do, but then we really have to do some quality control. And this is an ongoing process. First of all, you have to verify that the specimens were correctly georeferenced. Some of them that land in there were just wrong. You look at it closely, they weren't in the park. <laughs> you know, it was missed georeference. Others uh, ended up there just by accident. Um, so we go through that. Uh, and, and then the other thing that you can do, I didn't mention, you can search with a keyword. You could search for whiting rich or whiting, and you end up with a bunch of other specimens. You can georeference them after the fact, but you have to look at those labels very carefully because a lot of those were collected a, a long time ago, and you have to verify that indeed they were in the park, and sometimes you just can't be sure. So we actually have a doubtful, a whiting ranch vascular plant doubtful checklist that you can find. And these are specimens that, yeah, we're not sure that they belong in the ranch, but we don't want to totally get rid of them. Check identifications of the specimens. Again, this is an ongoing process. I'll talk about a few of these a little bit later. Uh, you can do that from online images, or you can, it's best to actually get the physical specimen, or you can have maybe curators or other people at the herbaria check it for you. And I have this uh, figure, this is depends on when you uh, start the calculation, but I think right before I started this, we had about 335, that was just my calculation wrong. And now we have, I calculated 603 per barium about this. Anyway, we, we, this was before we started this checklist. This was a little after Ron really started collecting a lot in Whiting Ranch, which was uh, 2022, just a couple years ago. Okay, and this shows one of the voucher specimens, and uh, Ron leads the pack. He's collected 500, I'm sorry, 419 herbarium voucher specimens in Whiting Ranch. So that's a pretty good feat. And uh, Rebecca will talk a little more about these herbarium specimens, how they're prepared and, and their importance. Okay, just a few other things about the checklist. To wrap up, we have a nice abstract with information about the project, a lot of links to iNaturalist, to CalFlora. We have the eight uh, CNPS inventory listed plants separately listed here. And then we have this uh, tabulation of what, how we calculated, how we categorized and organized non-native plants. So this is the checklist itself. When you look at it, uh, it has the taxa arranged by family first, alphabetically, and then with the, in the family, by the scientific name of the species. You can actually fool around with, you can organize it by species if you wanted to, just by clicking one of these buttons over here. So this just shows that, uh, just an example of it, Agavesi with the members of the Agavesi listed there. We list the, uh, I don't know if nativity is the right term, but whether it's native or naturalized and what or, or non-native and what category it comes under if it's non-native right there. And if it's uh, not native, we actually made an effort to point out where it's native to, which I think is, is nice, which isn't often in said the Jepson E4. There is an example of the Avarian voucher. Any herbarium specimen that's associated with that record is listed right there. You click it and then you get you go immediately to that CCH2 record that I talked about before. And again, this is one of Ron's collected a lot in the park. And again, you can see the uh, both the herbarium specimen and some field images that Ron did. Uh, we have links to both iNaturalist and CalFlora. That's a great resource with every specimen. Now, as we'll point out, and Ron mentioned, 99 of these are only documented with images from those two sources. Uh, not herbarium specimens, but most are, are with both or all three. And so you click that and you can see those records. So let me try to explain that. This is an iNaturalist project that we started for Winding Ranch, the same polygon. And you can see all the records from the iNaturalist observations right there. If you're familiar with iNaturalist, you'll, you'll know what this is all about, but you can click any one of these. And I just wanted to point out that 
Uh, once we have that link to the project, if you go out and make five more iNaturalist observations for the same species, they will automatically be included. So you'll see those as well as the ones that were there before. So we don't have to re-update uh, them. Okay, I want to point this out. It's it's kind of interesting to me, maybe it's not to you, but uh, we were able to uh, link some resources with regard to recent taxonomic changes. Some of the names we're using the checklist are not in the Jepson E4, and this is one of them. Uh, this is an article that cites the rationale for splitting the genus Kinopodium, the goose puts or goose feet, uh, into separate genera, the genera Blytum and Kinopodiastrum. It's actually a group that I'm working with uh, with a colleague of mine. So you can click that. You can you can actually, in many cases, go to the uh, journal article and judge for yourself. Do you think they are right in splitting that genus into separate genera? So the actual documentation for that. Uh, the mapping uh, features in the checklist are similar to the CCH2 in general. This is one of the maps that shows that allows you to check every record, those orange dots. If you click one, you'll see the CCH2 record. This is one at UC Riverside. I just happen to click that one right there. The ones in uh, triangles, by the way, are observation fields, which are uh, database portals that are in process of going to the, the database of a, of a major barrier. You can download the checklist as a word file and print it out if you so choose. You know, modify it, print it out, take it with you in the field. I usually just carry it, open it up on my cell phone in the field. You can also download it from your cell phone into a file on your cell phone. If you lose internet connection, be sure to do that. <laughs> it's, it's valuable. You can also download the uh, entire uh, information as a spreadsheet. You can use it on Excel, for example. So they're, it's pretty powerful. So these are some of the tabulations I came up with, similar to Ryan's already gone over this, the number of taxa that we uh, found. And it is interesting, there are quite a few non-native plants and I, I think that's a, a function of the fact that it's you know surrounded by some urban areas. So we have a pretty high percentage of non-natives, 39%. But you can see we, we, we're still working on this, but we have a, a total of 510 species, about 520 taxa including varieties and subspecies. And then this is how we tabulated um, the non-native plants that uh, Ron already went over and the number of taxa, and then the eight uh, taxa that I think Fred will talk more about that are CMPS listed in the inventory. Okay, still have work to do. 99 taxa have not been documented with voucher specimens. So check it out, cch2.org, if you'll remember that. Uh, just open it up, look at the features that I've gone over, find the Whiting Ranch, Wilderness Park, the vascular plant checklist. By the way, I think I started a bryophyte checklist. Again, it just has a very few. So that's something I'm actually interested in. If I have time, <laughs> I actually took bryology as a graduate student many years ago, before 1842. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a roommate up with Lydia's. <laughs> anyway, so anyway, thank you. Uh, now we'll go on to who's next? Right, yeah. Oh, which is forward to everybody else. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So I had to do this in kind of a hurry because I'm actually supposed to be doing a major talk in two days in Riverside. So that's sort of sort of limited how much I could actually do on this one. But, uh, so it's unusual for me to have a short talk. <laughs> anyway, so, okay, I'm Fred Roberts. I, I'm one on the Rare Plant Committee in, in uh, this chapter, and then various times I've been on a Rare Plant Committee uh, Chair and several other committees. So I've, I have quite a history of rare plants in Orange County and do a lot of work for the Orange County Parks uh, surveying in um, uh, the Lomas de Santiago area. No. What to do without him noticing them? Well, hold the mic a little closer, Craig. Closer? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. It's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, at least we're doing telepathy. This is telepathy. <laughs> it works. Okay. Anyway, so uh, uh, 
I haven't had a chance to really go after rare plants in Whiting Park very much yet, because again, this was year I was turned out I got swamped by another project. But uh, uh, sure, I will be speaking about that. So this is where we stand roughly on rare plants right now. This is about 125 records in the park. You see are pretty thin compared to the other one. And in part because, well, rare plants are rare, so we usually don't see quite so many of them as the other ones. That's not always the case, because in some cases, a rare plant can be pretty common locally and just rare everywhere else, or absent everywhere else. The uh, other reason is uh, some of them are pretty obscure, and only a handful of people really can put a name on something occasionally. And um, we just haven't had a chance to have people really look over uh, the entire park yet. I'm hoping this year to get out and actually do a little survey for rare plants. And notice I pushed that the right direction. I can press that. <laughs> now I have seven uh, officially rare plant plants here. And I have to realize that, that I had um, skipped possibly one, but I have to go back and figure out why I missed something. But anyway, uh, it also might be a difference of why the uh, what we're calling a rare plant here. So there's two species at least that are our highest ranked California rare plant rank one uh, B. These are plant species that are rare and endangered in California and elsewhere. Uh, we didn't have any rank two plants which were rare uh, in California, but um, common elsewhere. And there's a rank three which uh, we didn't have any for, or we almost had. I'm not sure that worked. Uh, that's for that's the ones for plants that they CMPS and fishing game are not quite sure what to do with yet. They're still studying them. And then there's uh, rank four, which we have at least five of. Um, these are ones that are considered limited or restricted distribution in California. And sometimes they're actually pretty rare. And other times they're um, relatively common where you find them. And again, they just don't occur over a very wide area of the state. And keep in mind that something is found mostly in Orange County and you pull your California map Orange County is a pretty tiny little place. So at a global scale, yeah, that's a pretty rare plant. Even if it's found on every hillside in Orange County, but uh, most of our ones aren't that rare. We have at least one additional locally rare plant. That probably should be two. Um, uh, locally rare plants are ones that are rare in Orange County. And uh, very, there's not many records or, well, they're often the ones I look at or ones that are considered somewhat threatened. I don't normally worry about the ones at the top of the Santa Mountains because they're not that left at that risk. But if you're down in Rancho Mission Viejo, it might be more of a problem. And these are also plants that are now being looked at seriously by the California Plant Society. They've actually had uh, several years worth of meetings now on trying to put together an actual official rare plant uh, category. Uh, that will be used by hopefully jurisdictions and counties to, to actually give a little bit of clout to some of these plants that otherwise wouldn't have any protection. Uh, so far, the county of Ventura has taken the lead on that. They actually recognize the, the, um, and use that in their uh, land planning uh, positions. You just really don't see that down here farther south yet. There's also a couple uh, sort of misfit rare plants down here. Those are plants that are rare in California, and uh, but they are actually not supposed to be a Whiting Regional Park, Whiting uh, Wilderness Park. So um, I'll say something about those in a minute. So pushing the button in the right direction. So it turns out that the two rarest plants in that park are two category 1D plants, are also two of my favorite plants. One is intermediate Mariposa lily, which is just sort of scattered around mostly in Serrano Canyon right now based on our records. I suspect it's actually much more widespread in the part uh, based on my surveys up farther north in the Lomas and San Diego area, Limestone Canyon, et cetera, where we found quite a few of them. Uh, but it's also mostly a fire follower. So in, in any typical given year, you only have a handful of morale. And then after a fire, you've got thousands of them sometimes. It's a very pretty plant. Uh, it can be extremely variable, range anywhere from almost a pale solid yellow to purple with all kinds of things in between. 
it's mostly known as like having lots of fringes on the hair on the petal edge. And uh, the, the color, sort of a champagne yellow, is sort of its base color. The other one is uh, Nolinus is Montana, Chaparral Nolina. This is the uh, easiest rare plant to spot in the park because you can actually see it on the hillside 500 feet away. But one of the problems with rare plants is many of them, you pretty much have to step on them pretty much before you can see them. But that one you can see from a distance and it's pretty well, it's probably distribution is probably pretty good based on the California iNaturalist that they, they probably captured most of the plants on the park at this point. It's um, a, a meal of human around different plants and it, it grows a stalk like an agave, not quite so large. The flowers are much smaller than you find again in the uh, uh, agaves. Then uh, four of the five, uh, right, four plants, we've got San Diego tar plant, or we've got Robinson's peppergrass, uh, Catalina mariposa lily, and Coulter's uh, Montilla poppy. The last one, Monomia Coulteri, is, I believe it's actually known for only just one site in the uh, park, the one that Ron found, um, down along uh, Ellsboro Road in Lisa Canyon. Then uh, the uh, uh, Candida Mariposa Lily is a little bit more scattered around, but again, mostly common in Strathmore Canyon. The peppergrass is, is very scattered, but that's a really tough one in the uh, to, for people to work out across the county because it's. It tends to bloom early, like in February sometimes. And by the time people are really looking for it, it's, it's now in uh, fruit. And loose salt basil leaves is what we usually use for adaptation. And uh, so it's often missed. It took years for us to sort out what it was. And as soon as we figured out what it was, then somebody came along, one of the experts, um, El Shabbat, and said, ah, no, I think all the all these plants belong to one subspecies that was originally found on a beach in Washington State. I'm a little bit leery about that. I, I, I get this taking fish and also has never actually visited in Southern California and took a look at the plants because ours, we had actually worked out a pretty good uh, argument about why they were on a tunnel apart. And he basically said that that was all wrong. And we don't quite believe that. But the complication and why that's important is I naturalist now recognizes the um, the more widespread subspecies. So if you're an naturalist, you can't find uh and Virginia Robinsonia. You have to search. You have to search on uh, Lepidium virginicum menziesii, and uh, that's now scattered all across the American West. So, anyway, and finally, San Diego tar plant's an interesting one because I actually it's it's native and it believe it got here on its own, but I don't think it actually was here uh, 15, 20 years ago. It appears to be spreading. Uh, it's um, the other complication would simply be that it tends to bloom a bit later than some of the other species and people may have just missed it before, but I've done a good little work looking for this plant 10, 15 years ago. We did not find it up in this general area, and we still haven't found it up on the uh, limestone area at all, but here it's starting to pop up now, and I suspect that's that's reason. There's another one that I forgot to put a picture in until last time when I drive up here. That's uh, Pastilia humbii, Humbius Pastilia. That's a pretty little plant, so it's kind of sad that you get a photograph for it. And, um, it's found pretty much on the uh, the Rocky Canyons along the Lomas de Santiago area, the western face of the San Mountains, and then cross the rings the LA Basin. Then there are two more plants that are, are listed for, but I don't think they're actually here natively. And that one is going to be the uh, uh, San Diego sunflower, Baharopsis lucinata. There's a couple scattered around. There's no known native populations in Orange County, but it's been spreading across Southern California. And then there's a walnut. Well, after Bob's little thing, I'm thinking where that walnut probably came from. But uh, the other problem with our local walnuts is that Orange County is a, a hot center for the native California walnut, Jutland's Californica, but uh, more in the in the um, Linda area. And uh, then it turns out that the one that occurs up in the Bay Area is apparently much more common in Southern California than we thought, and they're hard to tell apart. So we actually have to look at this walnut and make sure it's not one of four different species of walnuts, and it's actually the native one. And then finally, we've got uh, at least one locally rare plant. It used to be a CMPS listed plant, but the folks in San Diego 
years ago, it has curves of urban development over the entire county at their work. It's too common. Of course, almost all those areas got developed, so I'm not sure how common it is today. But um, I still track it. That's for example, for companies. Cute little sort of um, brilliant lime green um, plant that's pretty much spread out from the ground with white or yellow flowers. And there's a few records down uh, near Glen Ranch Road. And finally, I'm going to top this off with uh, just a few comparison um, things sort of tossed together pretty quickly. Uh, Join work. Some of the areas I've done some surveys for, or by Caspers, for example, with the CMPS Peak project a couple of years ago, just kind of comparing some of the diversity of rare plant studies. If you look around the, the, um, one, the 2,500 acre range, we're pretty much right up where you expect to be for, for Whiting Ranch, somewhere between seven and 10 species or so is what you expect. Next door, we've got Agua Chinon, which only has it only has three species. Uh, well, it's, that's a pretty hard area to survey, uh, but it's also half as many acres, so you kind of expect half as many rare plants. And then uh, a few other ones farther north, uh, again, pretty much in line. Casper's actually has a pretty good number of rare plants, but it is 8,000 acres, so you might expect that. And then there's the Dana Point um, Headland Preserve, which are a little bit of an anomaly in, in Orange County because uh, at least at one point, they had 19 different rare plants, which is 42 acres versus Casper's 8,000, virtually the same number of plants. That's pretty impressive. And just to note, the, the blue are actually locally rare plants. The reds are ones that are extirpated. One of the plants that's been extirpated on the Dana Point Headlands Preserves is Bob's Daisy. But sadly enough, it used to be pretty common. That's where Bob and I first pretty much met it. All right, so anyway, that's that's kind of a quick rundown on the rare plants. I think our next speaker is Rebecca. Okay, hey everyone. So sound good? All right. Let's see. So I'm gonna talk. Oops, what am I talking about here? I'm getting up a few times, so just to refresh myself here. Uh, I'm talking about some of the plants that were a little unexpected that we ended up finding at Whiting Ranch. Um, so these are some of those surprises. I have a lot of pictures. So uh all right. Oops. Oh man, I was doing so good there. Uh, all right, so the first one I want to talk about is Arctostanthus glandulosa subspecies glandulosa. This is a pretty common plant throughout California. It grows um, even into Baja California and up a little bit into Southern Oregon. Uh, and here in Orange County, we know it more from higher elevations in the Santa Ana Mountains. Uh, at Whiting Ranch, it's a little lower in elevation than we would usually find it. Um, and it's also very, uh, it's, it's our westernmost population of Arctostecla splingulosa, uh, subspecies splingulosa for the county. Uh, so this is a really fun population and I'm looking forward to, to studying this population a little bit more. I still haven't been out to see the fruits of this plant. So, uh, I'm hoping to go out and check out some fruit and, um, yeah, explore this population a little bit more. Uh, it grows on a very steep, exposed sandstone ridge um, within Whiting Ranch. Uh, I have a picture there of the burl. This is a burl sprouting from Lita, and you can see some of the um, some of the hairs on the inflorescence there. Those are both important characteristics when you're looking at Manzanitas. Uh, yeah. And here's, well, the general range in Southern California of Arctostephalus glandulosa, subspecies glandulosa. So you can see this one is coming down lower in elevation and uh, more westerly. Okay, this is a really neat plant. This was uh, an exciting find in that it, it's really the only modern uh, population of this plant that's that's in Orange County. 
looking at the old records of this plant, of the OEMB uh, Sarmentosa, they're all very, very old record. Well, you know, they're older records, uh, you know, from the 1940s. Um, and, uh, you know, collected by um, uh, Brandegee, Catherine Brandegee, and in 1960 by Gordon Marsh uh, in the Santa Ana Mountains. So in the, in the 40s, it was a record, um, let's see, I have them on the map. Um, it was a more coastal record and not even uh, an Orange County record. So I believe that was the one uh, up in um, the Long Beach area and yeah. Uh, so this plant is uh, known from uh, more aquatic situations and aquatic plant uh, and riparian locations. Um, it really speaks to a time when Southern California looked a little bit different, um, where there would have been more uh, wetlands and marshes. All right, another uh, plant here that was a, a neat one to find, Basilia ciliata. And this plant, we're starting to, well, it, it feels like recently we've been finding it more throughout Orange County. Um, so this plant uh, uh, tends to prefer uh, more clay soils. And so, you know, the population that I'm a little bit more familiar with, it was rediscovered in an area that was uh, mowed in preparation for potential restoration. So this might be a plant that uh, likes a little bit more disturbance or potentially has some um, uh, shading uh, issues where uh, when it gets crowded out by mustard, it tends to disappear a little bit. Uh, so, Basilia ciliata. Uh, and here are uh, locations. So, these and the previous slides show uh, locations that we have vouchers for. Uh, and that uh, green arrow towards the bottom that points out where the location is in Whiting Ranch and then uh, other population sprouts in California. Uh, so this, yeah, another neat find for us. Uh, Fraxinus dipedala. Uh, and this might be the most westernly population in our county. Uh, so this is a tree and Whiting Ranch was found um, uh, in, um, well, it was found by James Bailey, um, and this is one that we haven't been able to go back to and make a voucher collection of it, so hoping to uh, go track this plant down. It appears to be in very dense vegetation, and it appears very steep, so I suspect that may be why we haven't um, made it back to, to grab it. All right, and another one, uh, Kenston, Kenston centrianthifolius. Mm -hmm. So this is in Whiting Ranch, it's outside of its normal range. Uh, and again, this is known more from uh, older, older records. Um, so seeing it here again in Whiting Ranch, it's nice to have a, a more recent voucher of this, this plant. All right, so Ron is going to talk about uh, weeds. Weeds, not even. <laughs> yeah, of course, someone has to talk about the weeds. Uh, yeah, we've got a lot of those that are waiting. I'm going to just point out a few. Well, not a few, look at that. Uh, so that's kind of where the weeds are. They're all over. Um, and we vouch for those, and we, we do keep track of those as well. for other reasons. Uh, one of them that Mike talked about in, uh, a little earlier uh, that's pretty significant at the park is this one. It doesn't really have a common name, so it's Senecio infectifolius, and it created quite a bit of a stir. Mike Simpson is actually the person that properly identified it here in the county and in Southern California. Uh, quite a long story. The, you know, went to Australia, went to South Africa. We finally found a botanist, Mike did, in South Africa that was able to tell us what the heck it is. Um, and it is this. And uh, Mike authored uh, a paper that was published a year or so ago in the Bronio about it. So it's a very famous plant from Whiting Ranch, not native, 
and it's one that we're concerned about. Um, uh, we're trying to manage it so that it, we're, we're concerned that it may spread. It seems to be, um, seems to like native vegetation, not so much along trail sides. It's right out into the middle of intact habitat, and those are the most frightening. Uh, invasives. So anyway, that's one, and we want you to keep looking for it. We want you to memorize that little photo up there, and if you see it, we want to know. You can go to our website, you can contact us there, or just get it on an naturalist or tell Flora, and we'll pick it up. So if you find another population, you sure want to know. There's some other documentation that Mike already uh, talked about, and here's what we know about it in, in the United States. Uh, really, it's primarily uh, known from uh, some areas down in Camp Pendleton, John Redman and others have been documenting, and then now you can see we have two dots in Orange County. The dot to the right was a single plant, and uh, it was removed, and we surveyed and found no more. So that right-hand dot is probably gone, uh, but the left-hand dot is Whiting Ranch, and we've got, uh, mm, keep finding them. But uh, we're working on it, and parts is being great doing the management. And then just a kind of a slide of just some of the highlights. There's lots of non-natives and so on, of course. Uh, but some of the ones that I thought I'd point out are the buffalo grass, Penicillium ciliare. Uh, we have only the only population is a very small population in Orange County, uh, right at the very margin of the park. Uh, it's another one of those people in the sedums, mostly from the desert. Oh, you see that? Uh, Sahara mustard is just ubiquitous now in much of Southern California. Not everywhere, thanks to Joan. Where's Joan? There's that. Joan's single handedly trying to remove it from Orange County. Not single handedly, with Bob and Chuck and everybody else. Uh, but anyway, it's at what do you um, down to the bottom row, a uh, couple there that are just sort of interesting. Um, there's some concern that platinus, uh, the horticultural platinus, the London plane tree, it's often called, is hybridizing with our native taxa, uh, platinus racemosa, and creating a complex introgressive hybridization that's going on. And it's difficult to say for certain without some genetic work, um, but genetic pollution is another version of invasiveness that is an emerging issue. And there's some concern, I have some suspicion that some of the platinus that are at Whiting Ranch and a few other places are these complex hybrids now of this kind of Euro Eastern North American thing, which is a horticultural plant and our native uh, Western sycamore, and there are these kind of freaks now that are uh, that are fertile and back crossing and creating introgression, um, hybridization, and genetic pollution. And uh, this is real scary stuff. So if you're gonna the moral of that is if you're gonna plant the sycamore, plant the native one, not the uh, not the native mm -hmm. one. And then uh, just another. Uh, you know, oddity, we mentioned there's a few California native plants that are not native at the park, but are at the park. And this is one, it's a nice pretty plant. Uh, Rhymes arium, used in a native plant garden a lot. And somewhere along the way, 10 or 20 years ago, uh, some got planted uh, under the toll road, and now it's moving and, and kind of uh, spreading that little area. So, uh, but not native to Orange County even, uh, but from LA County and Northern. So we have the population of it at Whiting. And then uh, up on the top left, of the top, both, of the, both of those are the stink plants. The stink board at the top, um, spreading around Orange County. And then there at the bottom, uh, stink net is one that is under some management at the park. Um, spreading aggressively through Southern California, one of our really worst weeds uh, and really moving. Uh, but we're doing our best. And, and again, with Joan and her team and parks and some contractors trying to keep it at bay. Here's an example of 
I thought I had an example. I guess I don't. But anyway, it's it's thick on one you know, right over private property. There's just gobs of it. And then here's the park on this side and trying to keep it over there and not over there is quite a challenge. Uh, this is a, a plant that if you've been to Whiting Ranch, you've probably seen this patch. And there's everybody who you know goes down Borrego Trail seems to stop and take pictures of it and think they've found the you know craziest plant in the world. And uh, it is kind of a crazy thing. So it's this elephant ear uh, that's a little ways up uh, Borrego Canyon Trail, and uh, it's just naturalized there. And it has some taxonomic confusion. So it's either Colocasia esculenta or Colocasia fontanesii, or there's even a couple of other interpretations. And it just depends on which reference you want to look at. Whatever you want to call it, it's an elephant ear. And it's kind of cool. It, it, yeah, it just kind of is. You're just like walking along, and here's this thing growing in this wet area. Um, and it's been there for at least 25 years. And it keeps expanding a little bit. It has a cool flower. It's an aeroid. Uh, so, anyway, just a neat plant. Oh, there's the slide right out of order. So, there's an example of just thick. With Anta Siphon over on that, that's private property. We don't have much we can do about that. And then this is parked all over here. And we're trying to keep it on that side and not on that side. Good luck. How's it going, Joe? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're trying. Yeah, yeah. good. Yeah. Previous records were along the trail, mm -hmm. and then last year with the binoculars we saw this immense yeah. field yeah. in the private property. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, back to Mr. Simpson. Okay, very good. All right, so I was charged with uh, talking a little bit about some plant species that are taxonomically confusing or hard to identify, and some recent name changes that I'll introduce. One of them, a plant everybody knows, has a new name now, and I contacted the expert, so we got to get used to it. So uh, I just wanted to mention, I studied the Boracinaceae, I just I wanted to throw this slide in there. They're cute little plants. They, are similar in having these you know, coiled inflorescences like in the uh, fiddleheads. And we have pectocarias, we have plagiobotherus, right? So I don't want to talk about those, <laughs> but I did want to talk about cryptanthus. Yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> I do, but uh, you know, we have limited time. So I kind of specialize in cryptanthus. And cryptanthus are a little hard to identify. Um, <clears throat> I find them relatively easy now. I've gone through a lot if I have a specimen in front of me in a dissecting scope. But this is a common one all over the place. This is Cryptanthus intermedia. Now, the common name of Edis Cryptanthus is used by some, but it, this is the Cryptantha that is most commonly collected, has the most collection and the most photographs on iNaturalist or California because it's fairly widespread and it has relatively large flowers. And that's a relatively large flower. <clears throat> or a cryptantha. And of course, these are called popcorn flowers because the clusters of white flowers resemble a little popcorn uh, out in the field. So this one, intermedia, is relatively easy to identify. Typically, it'll have uh, these inflorescence branches in threes, although they can be in twos occasionally in, the, in one of the varieties. And if you look at the methods, they are Shaped like this, it's called lansoban, and they have these big tubercles and little tiny papillae. Hard to see without a magnifying lens, good hand lens. So uh, there are a lot of characters that define it, but this is the most common one you're going to see in our area. And I did want to mention at Whiting, we have both uh, varieties, and here's a distribution map of the varieties in the ones that have been collected at Whiting Ranch. Just a couple, I guess. Those are voucher specimens. And then this is a map from the CCH2 that I, I talked about earlier. You can see that the two varieties that I'll mention in just a second, the yellow is a little closer to the coast, 
and the blue a little more toward the mountains, but they do integrate. And John Rebin and I have studied these and we think the variety is the best uh, category for them, but we do need to do uh, genetic. I'd like you to work on this. So here's how you tell them apart. So that's not a great photograph, but if you look at the stems, if you're interested in this, when you see the Cryptantha that has pretty big flowers, you know, everybody should have a hand lens. How many in the audience have a hand lens with them? I do, right here. <laughs> you should eat and sleep with your hands. <laughs> Including well, <laughs> anyway, um, when you look at what that at the stem, uh, just below the inflorescence of the hand lens in Cryptantha intermedia variety intermedia, you're going to see little hairs, trichomes that are oppressed right against the stem, lots of them, and you'll see some hairs that come out. That's not a great photograph that are we call spreading. Whereas in variety John Stone guy, named after Ivan Johnston, who was the guru of Boragenaceae from Harvard. Uh, you'll only see spreading trichomes, and they're a little finer, what we call hearsay, as opposed to his bit. So look for that. Also, John Stonei has fruiting, they call fruiting calyces, the mature fruits that are pretty perpendicular uh, relative to the stem, and the more ascending in the other varieties. So you can tell these apart. Oh, I, I should mention, I have a website uh, that has a lot of photographs of keys on this called the Amsinkiani website. <laughs> anyway, you can check it out. Uh, if you want, if you're really interested in these plants. So that is a common one. We have both varieties in whiting. We have both varieties of caspers. They're kind of intermixed, but Johnstonia tends to be a little closer to the coast. In the Laguna Coast Wilderness, I've only seen variety of Johnstonia, for example. Uh, just the other Cryptanthos in whiting. This is one uh, that's pretty easy to identify. Some of you may know it. Cryptantha microstachys, the home Cryptantha. And it has little tiny corallos. Up there, you can barely see the little tiny flowers, little tiny fruits. It's a small one. Micro stachys means small spike, referring to, to the inflorescence. And uh, so it's pretty easy to tell apart from intermediate, obviously. If you look at the nutlets, they're totally different. There's usually just one per fruit, and they're smooth and shiny. So with Cryptanthus, you want to try to, I'll reiterate again, <laughs> try to pull out those nutlets if they're present and put them in the palm of your hand. If you have a, you know, some type of macro photography, you can photograph them. People are doing that more now. Uh, so that's, that's important in identification. And the third species is this one. This is one of my favorites, Cryptantha muricata. It has three varieties recognized. And this is variety muricata, but this also has relatively large corollas. But it's not common in whiting ranch. It's not common in Orange County either that I'll talk about. It has different types of nutlets. They actually have, sorry, they actually have a little ridge going up here that's hard to see. They're more ovate in shape. Uh, the thing about muricata is when you, let me just go forward. When you look at the fruits, they're more ovoid in shape, uh, kind of egg shaped. Okay. And this is the plant that I found at Whiting Ranch. It was, I was excited about it. It was one day when I was collecting, it was hot, I was sweaty, but there was one more hill that was a little higher than the other. So I'm just going to go for it. And there it was on the top of that hill in the southern part of the park and going down the slope. So this was a, a pretty good find for Orange, uh, for the Whiting Ranch area and for Orange County. Here's a distribution of the three varieties of this species. And you can see patterns right away just with the color coding. Variety Jones, yeah, it's more common in the south. And then uh, this one, Muricata, is more common in the transverse range. And then the other one, Denticulata, is uh, the common one in the Sierras. It's actually a little bit different from the other two. So uh, it was kind of a good find. It's, it's the only record in Whiting. In fact, it's only one of three records in Orange County. And the other two reflected in 1908 and 1928. Hmm. And there they are. Here is the Whiting Ranch one, and here are the other two, there and there. And that's probably no longer present. I think one of them was actually at Rancho Santa Ana. Um, they say Rancho Santa Ana, that's where the Botanic Garden used to be, by the way, in Orange County, if you didn't know that. So that was kind of a good find to me. It's, it's relatively rare in Orange County. And then this thing. So let me tell you the truth. I don't really know this group well. I At the end of the Botany Blitz, I was with my team and I saw a castaway that looked a little different from the typical Castilea affinus, if you know Castileas. But that looks different. So I collected it, photographed it. I took it back to the lab and made images there. 
I sent the images, the collection information to Mark Edgar, who's an expert in the group. You know, the easiest way to identify a plant is just to ask somebody who knows. <laughs> ask somebody, <laughs> ask an expert. <laughs> you know, don't go through the effort yourself, just ask somebody and then you can backtrack, figure out what it was. So he said, oh, that's uh, this one. That's the way of sub-inclusive variety gypsonia. And he said it integrates with Castilea finest. I thought, oh shit, you know, it integrates <laughs> with it. But uh, he was convinced that's what it is. And it does have the technical characters that distinguish it from uh, Castilea finest. This thing, these are actually three, they call Corolla teeth. So, you know, flowers have corollas, and Castileas have five petals that are all fused together, but the three lower ones can look weird. And they're called teeth. And he, he even looked at this and said, that's strange for this taxon, uh, for this particular variety. So this needs further investigation for sure. And this is just the keys. I'm not going to go through there, but there are technical characters you can use to tell them apart. And here are the distributions, by the way. There is that collection of this taxon. It is the only one in Orange County, so if it's accepted, it would be a record for Orange County. But you can see it's not uncommon uh, along the coast in California. Uh, you can see with this, this map from Baja, California, northward. And then this one, the Gutierrezia. So, you know, I've been looking, we've all been looking. If you know these, these are the matchweeds. I don't think people know them in here. There are two species, two common species, Serotri so and Californica. And for a long time, I thought I knew them. <laughs> and the key used to say, you know, how the heads were clustered or not. And then uh, Tom Chester, a few years ago, really looked at the literature, and I was unaware of this. He looked at this paper, which is cited on our website, uh, Solbrig, 1965. And Solbrig pointed out that Californica is actually a polyploid, which means it has multiple sets of chromosomes. And it was probably derived from Cero 3. So those, these two are reproductively isolated from one another, but they're hard to tell apart. And the characters that we used to use don't work very well. So Tom Chester clarified this, I think, very well. And he he's a very he's into quantification. So he measured a lot of, of these heads and concluded that it's really the um, you know the size of the involucre, those bracts at the base of the head, the length and the width that distinguish them, but you have to look at multiple individuals and lots of different uh, flowers as well to tell them apart and kind of um, add them all together, I'll add all the numbers together. So this is a difficult thing, <clears throat> these two, and I did collect a few of these at Casper's and I was convinced they were all Cero 3, but I haven't really looked at it. I don't think any of us have really looked at this critically. I don't trust the iNaturalist observations now, not without a ruler next to the head. So I think this is one of those we're going to have to, as I'll point out in just a second, collect more and, and identify. And look at, this is the map from Tom Chester. <laughs> Here's Serotri. He said it's only Serotri is in San Diego County with the exception of one plant in San Diego State that might be Californica collected in the desert, but it's kind of a lousy specimen. And then he mapped out where Californica is according to his observations. Look, we're right in the interface between the two. So this is a taxonomic issue. And these are good species. They are, like I said, different chromosome numbers, but just hard to tell apart. So here's my gist on this word, cryptanthos, which I think cryptanthos are relatively clean to identify, particularly the ones here. But if you don't know them, you don't have the right characters, they're hard to identify. So if you photograph them, please, in addition to photographing the flowers, if you can pull out some of the netlets and put them, like I said, in the palm of your hand photograph or take them home, and also photograph the stem trichomes and maybe a close-up of the calyx. Good photographs will, will nail them. Otherwise, we're going to need a specimen. These castellas, we're going to have to work on, I think. I think we need to collect a few more and send them to Mark Egger. We need to collect duplicates, send them to the expert, but also ourselves, you know, look at some of the features. Castellas are a little tricky because you have to dissect them. You have to look at the calyx, the brats. They're often kind of smashed together on the specimen. So that's what we need to work on. And then Goody Arisi, I think this would be a great student project 
Well, you have to <laughs> who wants to do this? I got all the next row letter. All right. So <laughs> one of these students, if you want to do this, <laughs> once you once you get it figured out, you can spend hours and hours in the herbarium and measure them and, and figure out what's going on with those two species. But we need to work on them. We think they're good species, they're just hard to tell apart. And the last thing I just want to mention, just a few name changes if you know these plants. Anybody know this plant, Junastrum? Okay. Junastrum sinanthoides, variety part weedgill, part weedgii is what we've been calling it, is now Junastrum heterophyllum. This is a partly a nomenclatural change, partly based on taxonomy. It is absolutely true, you know, based on this article. You can look at a fish vine in Ghana, I know, a Mark fish vine. And so this is just a name change, it's a Bella name. So I don't know if it's in the Jepson E4 yet. So that's one of the name changes. This is another one, some great photos by Ron Vanderhall. This Antorhinum is a true heat genus because we're not sure what to do with it yet. At least I'm not in some of my colleagues, but this is a clear case where this species uh, belongs in another genus, Neogerinum, which I believe means new earth, like new world, the new world as opposed to the old world. And then Rhinum means nose, okay? <laughs> where anti rhinum comes from. So this particular species is now called Neogerinum strictum, so another name change you have to get used to. Mm. Uh, the uh, family that, well, Sambucus nigra, subspecies cerulea. Now, when I first came to California, I learned this is Sambucus mexicana. Guess what? It's back to Sambucus mexicana. <laughs> this whole complex is a mess. I remember looking into the synonymy. One time, oh my goodness, I didn't want to touch it. There's so many synonyms, so many variants. It really needs a detailed molecular study to figure it out. So that name is back to Sambucus mexicana. All of our elderberries are Sambucus mexicana. Makes it easy. And the family name has changed. It used to be the Adoxaceae. It used to be Caprifoliaceae when I came to California. Then Adoxaceae. Now it's Vibernaceae, the Viburnum family. This is based on nomenclature. That's a concern name. So this is based on the interpretation of the Jepson E. flora. And the last one for best, Brassica nigra. <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> Some of you know this. <laughs> so Brassica nigra has changed its scientific name. This is one of those examples where common names are sometimes uh, more consistent and e easier to, you know, <laughs> than the scientific names. But Brassica is actually a very unnatural Genius has been intensively studied by a number of people, including, I think some of you mentioned Al Shabazz. He said Al Shabazz. I actually emailed him. He's one of the experts in the group. Yeah, you did, Fred, with referring to the Lepidium. Uh, and he said, yep, he's convinced this is the correct name for it. Uh, we were calling it uh, this one, Ramphospermum nigrum, not too long ago, but that is not correct because this is the prior name. So he's convinced that's what we're going to call it. The, the true brassicas are going to include Oleracea, our cold crops, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, and so forth. That's true brassica. They're actually fairly distantly related from this. So brassica nigra is going to change names pretty soon and call mutarda nigra. I can't figure out what mutarda means, but it's easy to remember. Uh, just put an S there and you have mustard. Give it a okay? <laughs> <laughs> mustard, mustard bar. But then you have to do the S. Mutara <laughs> Nigra. Why couldn't it be Mustard? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Just a few. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, that's all I have. Okay. I think I'm tired of that. Okay. I've been holding it all night. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to go through, um, well, what do we have left to get to, to wrap up this, this project? There are uh, 99 plants that we don't have vouchers for. So going back to, to kind of one of our original goals is to make sure that we have these defensible uh, voucher specimens made of all of these taxa. Uh, so what does that look like? 99 plants. It actually fits onto two sheets of paper with room for me there <laughs> as well. Um, you know, and so the, the kind of most species rich uh, families, that's where we have the most work to do. Uh, so 
Also, the cactus family. We've made no collections of things on the cactus family because they're so darn prickly. And for the Casper's project, my really did a, a great job at, at really making a concerted effort and and vouching a lot of the cactus so i think that's just what it's going to take it's going to take one day as the plants are in flower really gearing up getting gloves getting our tongs and um, serrated knives going out there and making some good collections uh really uh cactus um and other succulent stem plants require a little bit of extra uh, preparation in making the specimens to make a good specimen. You need to make um, good uh, sections through the flowers um, in some of the cases um, and good collections of, of stems. Um, yeah, it's it's not terrible, but you, know, you just gotta get in there and do it. <laughs> um, and as Tracy, so uh, we still have 10 uh, taxa to collect here. Um, so I, I picked out a few of the fluffiest that I could find there. So we've got, um, uh, what do we have here? We've got uh, Microbus californicus, and we've got Solcarpus brevissimus over on the other side, and um, our dandelion in the middle, and uh, Eclipta prostrata there on the top right side. So just a, a selection of, of some of the Asteraceae left to get. Uh, in the Boise, also, we have 10 taxa to collect here. Uh, a picture of a few of them, uh, native on the, oops, I think I got my left and right mixed up, apologies. So on the right, we've got uh, uh, Bophria cloa barbinoides, and on the left, uh, Penicetum clandestinum. Excuse me. I'm just going to skip that one. Uh, all right. Other plants that we haven't collected, I've kind of grouped these uh, artificially into elusive plants. We have some very small, tiny plants that um, still need to have voucher assessments. So the uh, Calatriche had a plant villa. Those are in uh, wet areas, um, vernally uh, wet areas, ponds, swales, other areas, scutularia, tuberosa. Those are in more open areas. Um, often coming up after fires, but not always. Um, and Tridanus by Flora, another really small uh, plant in, um, yeah. Um, right. And this is an interesting case. Uh, I didn't put the name on there, but um, so this plant, uh, Athlon, so we're not quite sure what it is, and it may in fact be an undescribed species. That's kind of what, what the um, um, research done by Allison Caldwell of it, I believe Davis, um, is looking into that, and that's what it's looking like. So this plant was last spotted, I believe, in 2020. Uh, it was first spotted um, before that, what, 2013? 2004. 2004, like okay, even yeah. earlier. Um, and so folks have known that it's around, but determining what it is and getting uh, another good voucher of it or further study when it comes up again. So it, we've been looking for it every year. Uh, so this is a, a bit of a fun mystery. Um, And the last part here, uh, so the last piece of this, well, we, we hinted at this, so the specimen or the plants that are collected and vouchered, uh, we look for them, we find them, we collect them. Uh, the plants are then brought back to the herbarium where they're mounted uh, after they're dried and pressed onto archival paper at the herbarium. So last summer, uh, I held five volunteer sessions, um, and I see some folks that came out and participated in those sessions, uh, and we mounted over 350 specimens. So here are a couple of shots of that process of uh, the specimens coming to us on newsprint. Uh, they're arranged on newsprint and glued or strapped on. Uh, so those are some of our tools that we use, uh, very, you know, uh, glue, um, gum, linen, and tape. Uh, and they're art artfully arranged on paper, 
Um, and hopefully these specimens are gonna last in perpetuity. Uh, so how you can help us, we still have many specimens to mount. Uh, so come volunteer with us at the UC Irvine Herbarium. Uh, also continue to go out to Whiting Ranch and make observations on iNaturalist and Calflora. Uh, that's, oh, well, thank you, Ron. <laughs> yeah, so here's an example of incoming specimens for their herbarium. Uh, so Ron has uh, prepared these for me to my exacting specifications with the names on the outside of the sheet. Uh, so we'll see. I see, oh, Ron, this is a special one. This is Joan Miller, number one. Oh, the first one, yes. <laughs> Let's see what it is. Oh, it looks like some kind of lapis. So yeah, here's how they come. Oop. That's a lot of lapis. Yeah. So I'm excited to get those in. They'll spend two weeks in the freezer and then uh, we'll pull them out and we'll mount them. I have a group of five, five six interns. Uh, this quarter that are working with me to mount plant specimens. One of their requirements is to host volunteer sessions. So stay tuned. My students are going to be hosting, uh, hopefully, everyone to come to the herbarium. Uh, so a big thank you to uh, especially Orange County Parks that have helped us really through every stage of this project from permitting to access. I think in one week, I think probably all five of us individually got in contact with parks to go take a visit. So thank you for, for um, having us out. Um, also, thank you to jo Joanne Schwartz who helped coordinate, no small feat, uh, the botany uh, blitz at Whiting Ranch. Uh, we had, what, close to 100 participants. Um, and Joanne really was the person who helped to make that organizational effort um, and for Dr. Peter Bowler uh, for ensuring that there's still a place um, in Orange County uh, to donate these specimens. Uh, all the CMPS members who helped during the botany blitz um, that are out there making observations and helping at the herbarium. Uh, thanks to everyone. And thank you also to my fellow participants, uh, Ron, Fred, Mike, and Bob. Thank you guys. Um, thank you everyone for listening. And there's also the Celia Hunbag there in the center. Picture <laughs> there for you, Fred. <laughs> so thank you. Any other questions? Uh, email me. You're also welcome to email uh, any of the team links. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I want to point out Alyssa Flint, Alyssa Flint over here from OC Park. Thank you, Alyssa. And, and, and Matt Major. And, oh, is Matt here? <laughs> oh, and Matt Major over there. And Jennifer Magley is probably looking at her online in OC Parks. Candace Hubert is online looking at her. So thank you to all of you. Jennifer's also online. Thank you. It's 2012. Right. Okay, okay. Let me get a speed check. Yeah, there you go. Probably. 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 Probably